did a video a while back talking about Elon Musk's company Neuralink that are working to create brain-computer interfaces, basically implants in the brain that allow us to communicate with a computer with our thoughts. But it turns out they're not the only people working on this technology. On my Patreon channel, the highest tier allows people to ask questions that I will answer in a video once a month. I have failed to do it every single month, but that's what this video is. This video took questions from people in the Patreon community, and here are those answers. Mads Rune Haugstedt asks, can you do a video about the doctor working on brain implant technology? Mads referred me to a really interesting article from the MIT Technology Review website. I will put the link down in the description below. What I'm gonna talk about here just kind of like skims the surface of it. If you want a deeper detail, definitely go check out that article. So yeah, in my previous video on Neuralink, I talked about how they are working on brain implants that are gonna give people the ability to communicate with computers, but really what they're starting out working on is working with paralyzed people, giving them some kind of mobility and the ability to operate robotic arms using only their mind. Ultimately, as they perfect this technology with paralyzed people, they will be able to start implementing it with people who are not paralyzed, who are perfectly healthy, but ultimately they want to get people the ability to download information from the internet. Keep going from there and you get into the idea of people being able to actually communicate telepathically. We would just be able to talk to each other without using our voice. Really interesting stuff. But the main purpose that Elon got involved with Neuralink has to do with AI. He's concerned that AI is gonna pose an existential threat to our species if it becomes too smart for us, that we would not be something, we would not be able to keep up with the progress of AI intelligence. But if we could merge with it through the use of neural implants like this, then it wouldn't be something that leaves us behind. We could be able to kind of progress along with it. Well, there's a guy that's already working on brain implants that could get us a lot closer to that reality. His name is Dr. Eric C. Luthard. He is a brain surgeon at the University of Washington in St. Louis, and he has created a company called Neurolutions to develop this technology. He's also an author that explores these kinds of topics in the books that he writes, in the novels that he writes. He has a book called Red Devil 4 that apparently uh, deals with this technology quite a bit. So Dr. Luthard is one of these people that was kind of in the right place at the right time with the right skill set. He actually works with people with severe epilepsy, people who just are non-functional out in the real world. And they have a lab where they basically put these kinds of neural implants uh, in the brains of these epileptic people. And what they do is they monitor to make sure to, to kind of determine what signals are being created by the brain so that they can uh, predict the seizures that they have and then use those same implants to control the brain and prevent those seizures from uh, taking place. But to go back and give a little bit of history, back in the 1980s, um, some of the doctors at Johns Hopkins University, specifically Apostolos Georgiopoulos, <laughs> is like the most awesome name I've ever heard. Uh, he identified neurons in the higher motor cortex that fired when people controlled certain parts of their, their bodies. He was testing on monkeys and they were actually able to predict uh, not just where they would move their hands, say, in 3D space, but also how fast. A guy named Andrew Schwartz, who was a protege of Dr. George Apollos, actually took it a step further. Instead of just monitoring and seeing which neurons are firing to, you know, when they move their hands, these monkeys, he was able to actually use the implants to control their hands. And then eventually he was able to train the monkeys to use robotic arms, to move robotic arms with their thoughts. Now, Dr. Schwartz and Dr. George Apollos were kind of limited because they were only monitoring specific neuronal firings in certain parts of the brain. They weren't covering a very wide swath of the brain, whereas Dr. Luthard, with his epilepsy patients, they actually laid an entire net down across the cortex of the brain. So they were able to monitor hundreds of thousands of neurons at a time, get a much more precise view of where these things are coming from. So Dr. Luthart teamed up with a guy named Gerwin Schalk, who was a computer scientist at the New York Department of Health. And after a few years of training with these patients, they were actually able to play space invaders using just their mind. So then the military got involved, and this is amazing. What they were trying to do was make it so that soldiers could communicate with each other through neural implants telepathically. Now you can imagine they're out in the field, there's a lot of explosions, a lot of noise, a lot of chaos, and to be able to just communicate without having to use their voice uh, would be a huge advantage. So then Dr. Luthard and his team, they had to start looking at language. They had to look at the language centers of the brain and try to figure out if they could actually determine by monitoring neurons what words are being said. So they started out by testing some of these, you know, bedridden epilepsy patients. They had 12 of them in his lab. And they, they started by just reading very simple words, very, you know, like consonant, vowel consonant sound words like bat, beat, boot. And they uh, had them say them out loud and then just think them. So when they vocalized a word, it fired off some signals in their motor cortex and their auditory cortex, and then another part of the brain next to the auditory cortex that they always 
believed was associated with speech processing. And then they had them think the words and they fired the exact same neurons. Currently the accuracy rate is at about 45% meaning that they can tell if somebody is listening to the Gettysburg Address or the I Have a Dream speech. Through all this research, Luthar believes that right now he could put a brain implant in a person's brain that would allow them to move a cursor through 3D space and even be able to tap into a smart home system and turn lights on and off to be able to control a thermostat and all that kind of stuff. He doesn't think it's something that's really going to be feasible that people would actually do for a while though until it becomes something non-invasive. Non-invasive obviously meaning you don't have to drill into somebody's skull. It would be something that they could read the brain waves from the outside of the skull. But it turns out that the bone in the skull actually dampens a lot of the brain waves that come out. So that's proving to be more difficult than they would like. But they're making progress. His team at Neurolutions actually has a non-invasive brain interface that people can wear for stroke victims that's actually in clinical trials right now. One unexpected benefit of working with stroke victims is that you know, when, when the stroke kills the brain cells on one side of the brain, they can actually tap into the motor cortex on the other side of the brain to control a side of your body that doesn't normally control. And what it allows them to do is they can train these people to work a robotic arm with those cells. And then as those connections get made in their brain, they can take away the robotic arm and it actually improves the function of their arm in real life. In other words, patients that were thought to be beyond being able to improve their motor function were able to improve their motor function with this device. As he said in a TED talk, he said that they basically just needed a little push to get things going. He said that this thing hasn't quite caught on with quadriplegics because there's already so many ways out there for them to communicate. I mean, if you look at Stephen Hawking just being able to use you know, one little muscle below his eye, he was able to communicate with that. So they haven't really had a need to go this way with it. But he really believes that they are on the cusp of a technology that's going to completely change the evolution of our species. And what he's looking for right now is a new way to scan the entire brain instead of just the cells that happen to be near where the implant is. Anyway, really interesting stuff. Links down in the description. I will definitely be talking more about this as it develops. Another question from Patreon, AltPod asked, Hello Joe, since you went full-time on YouTube, how many subs have you gained? Do you consider yourself successful now, and what are you aiming for in 2018? So the last time I got any paid work outside of YouTube was in January, I believe, and I've been doing YouTube full-time ever since then. And, uh, you know, I, I ended the year last year at about 85,000 subscribers. I'm now sitting at about 161 at the time of this recording, so I've added about 80,000. And where this gets interesting for me is... Um, Okay, I'll, I'll confess, I spend way too much time <laughs> looking at my analytics and trying to figure out where things are going to go on the channel and how many subscribers I'm going to get and where the views are going to go and all that because it matters. The more subscribers I get, the more views I get, uh, the more revenue I pull in, the more I can reinvest that into the channel and do more things. And so it, it, it really you know, is determining the direction of the channel as it goes forward. And as I looked back over the last, uh, not just last year, but since 2014 when I started getting serious about it, what I noticed was um, that the number of subscribers actually doubled at least two or three times each year uh, going all the way back to 2014. Of course, in the early days, the doubling from 100 to 200 was not that big a deal. Um, but last year, it, it went from, I don't know, what I start the year off with like around 20,000 and ended at 80,000. So it was like 20, 40, 80. So it, it doubled a couple of times. So it's, it's sort of like an exponential curve when you look at it that way. And when I extrapolate that out to this year, I started at 85. Um, if it doubled twice this year, I'm hoping it would get up to around 300,000 by the end of the year. Now, I have no proof that that's gonna happen. Um, that was just what I was hoping for. But after I had that crazy viral thing a couple of weeks ago with the severed head thing, my, you know, I had this huge explosion in subscribers and I'm already at 161. Doubling of 85 would be 170. So I'm, I'm almost there already. Um, it just, will that double by the end of the year again? I don't know, we'll, we'll see. As for whether I consider myself successful, I mean, you know, honestly, I consider anybody who gets to do something that they enjoy for a living to be successful on, on some level. It doesn't really feel like success to me because I'm still working 12, 15 hours a day and I don't get weekends and all that, but um, if I had seen somebody in my position about a year ago, I would have said, yeah, that person's successful. So I guess, I guess I've reached some level of success, but even still, I don't, I don't pat myself on the back about it too much because the only reason that I've been able to grow the way I have and the way I've been able to, to do this for a living is because you guys are watching. Um, you know, I, the only reason I'm able to do this is because you guys have given this to me. So at the end of every video, when I, when I say love you guys at the end, uh, I mean it because um, you, you've given me this 
and I love you guys for it. Paul Yas asked, I really liked your candid video about what it's like now that you're a YouTuber. That was a Patreon only video that I did. Can I ask a question like, can you do another one covering how you fit your new job, <laughs> like he's job in quotations, in around your family life, and how long does it take you to do a video? Do you have a schedule? Do you feel trapped sometimes? Do you give yourself time off? Do you have a goal, et cetera, et cetera? More questions about behind the scenes stuff. Interesting. So it's funny you should say that because I'm actually working really hard right now to get more organized um, with my putting videos out because something they don't tell you when you become a YouTuber is that you don't get time off. <laughs> there are no holidays. There are no sick days. If you're not putting out videos, you're not, you're not making money and you're not paying your bills and you're not growing. So um, I have to try to get organized and get ahead on my videos so that when I need to take time off, or even if there's an emergency, like if my, if my computer blows up on me, I would be screwed right now. So I need to try to get ahead by a few videos or at least have a few sitting around that I can use should, uh, should I need to tap into that. Yeah, so I actually came up, just came up with this system here where I wrote down on the calendar uh, all the different uh, segments of each video. I kind of broke down the process of making a video into five different areas and I kind of tried to parse those out so I'm not doing too much each day. But this also, if I'm able to stick to this, will give me some weekends. I actually tried a small version of this at the beginning of March because uh, my wife's a teacher and she had spring break off. I wanted to try to spend some time with her and I kind of just, I kind of just needed a break myself. So I, I implemented that and it worked well enough to where I was able to schedule out a couple of videos ahead and take a little time off. So um, I'm, I'm back on it again and uh, we'll, we'll see if it'll actually allow me to take some time off this summer when she gets off work. Um, Cause I'm gonna, I'm gonna need a break <laughs> again at some point. Now you use the word trapped in your question. I don't know if that's the word I would use, but it is just like being in a box with no escape while your air is running out. I'm just kidding, but it, it, it is a grind sometimes. There are some days when the very last thing I wanna do is turn these lights on and start talking into the camera. I just don't have it in me, but I do it anyway because it's, it's my job now, you know? I think that's kind of the thing that separates the wheat from the chaff, that, you know, the professionals from the amateurs. You do it even if you don't want to do it. I mean, if you're a newscaster and you just don't feel like going on TV that night, well, too bad. It's your freaking job. You know, do your job. As for my goals for the channel, um, you know, I, I had a sort of a subscriber goal that I talked about a minute ago, but in terms of what I want this channel to, to be, I, uh, I want to start building a team around the channel. Um, I already have uh, Jason from J Theory, the J Theory, uh, YouTube channel. He's been helping me out with some some scripting and that kind of thing. Um, I have some editors that I'm friends with that are kind of sitting there waiting to take some of these jobs once I get organized enough and once I can afford to pay them. I'm not quite there yet. But um, I'm, I'm hoping to, you know, kind of get a system together, get a team together, and eventually be able to start doing some on-location stuff. I mean, I have a nice little set here, but it would be nice to get away from it and go, um, you know, do some things out in the real world every once in a while. Um, I want to do more narrative content, short films and comedy sketches and that kind of thing. You know, and I'm hoping in the next couple of years I can take this on to places like Netflix and Hulu, uh, create some shows around, you know, some of the topics that I talk about on here and uh, yeah, just kind of keep expanding this thing and keep blowing people's minds. But that's it for now. I want to thank those guys for the questions and just for being awesome supporters on Patreon. Obviously, if you would like to join them and get access to some of the stuff that we're doing on Patreon, the Discord channel where you can go to the Discord server, where you can go and hang out with everybody and discuss topics, and it's a lot of fun. You can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. But with that, I'm signing off. Definitely go check out that uh, article down there about the Neurologic guy. Um, really some interesting concepts that are going on there. You guys have a great rest of the week, and I will see you next Monday. Love you guys, take care.